Hi there. I'm Adam Shostak, and today for the Tripwire Threat Intelligence University, I'd like to share with you threat modeling lessons from Star Wars and elsewhere. Today I'm going to talk to you about three main things and then give you some resources to learn more. Those three things are what is threat modeling, share with you a simple approach to threat modeling, and then top 10 lessons that I've learned along the way. So what is threat modeling? Threat modeling is something you can do while preparing to deploy a system or preparing to build a system to think about the threats that are associated with it. That is, what might go wrong. Now, over the years, in an effort to help people threat model, we've made it complicated. We've built steps that can be hard to follow. But really, threat modeling is something that we all do. If I were to ask you to help me threat model my house, you might start by asking about the doors and windows. You might start by asking me about my family members or family heirlooms inside the house. You might ask, start by asking me about the sort of people who might break in. And in each of these, you're engaged in the essence of threat modeling. You might be focused on the entry points. You might be focused on the assets. You might be focused on the attackers. But you know how to do this. And I want today to help you learn to build on that knowledge that you've accumulated over the years to help you see how to threat model for the software that you're building so that you can do it as part of the way you build new systems. So let me start off with a simple approach to threat modeling. And this is an approach that I developed while I was working at Microsoft helping people threat model but it's not Microsoft specific. I've trained people on this methodology from tiny startups to huge IT shops, banks, at government agencies, at all sorts of different places. And the essentials carry over from place to place. They carry over from project to project. So let me tell you about this simple approach. It's built around four questions. The first question is, what are you deploying or building? The reason I like to start here is because it's something that you know about. If you're building a system, if you're deploying a system, you understand what it is you're building. The next question is also a pretty natural one. What can go wrong? Well. That's a pretty broad question, and we'll talk about ways to focus in on what can go wrong. Once you know what can go wrong, you can ask, what are you going to do about it? And then the last question, did you do an acceptable job at numbers one through three, is a quality assurance question. So as an example, when I ask, what are you building? When I build things, I often start out at a whiteboard. I draw what it is I'm going to build. And you can threat model with nothing more than a whiteboard diagram. You can use a data flow diagram like this, where external entities are represented by rectangles. Running code processes are rounded rectangles. There are data flows between them. There's data stores where the data is stored. And there are trust boundaries representing the places where different principles interact. You might also have a swim lane to represent network data flows. However you are naturally representing, the thing which you are building or deploying is a good place to start threat modeling. You might need to add trust boundaries to show where the security boundaries are, what you expect to have in force. But the way in which you represent things naturally is the best place to start with your threat modeling activity. So let's move on to question two. 
what can go wrong? And when we ask what can go wrong, there's a mnemonic that I like to use, which is STRIDE. STRIDE stands for Spoofing, Tampering, Repudiation, Information, Disclosure, Denial of Service, and Elevation of Privilege. I assume you all have that. Let's move on to the next thing, right? Now, now let's go a little bit more slowly and walk through spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege one by one. And to help you remember these, I have a few graphics. The S in stride stands for spoofing. And whether that's Luke Skywalker pretending to be a stormtrooper, whether it's someone pretending to be a Nigerian prince he'd like to share his money with you, someone pretending to be PayPal.com or some other financial website which would like your username and password, each of these is an example of someone or something pretending to be someone they're not. So the F in stride stands for spoofing. The T in stride stands for tampering. And whether that's Ben Kenobi turning off a power unit, whether it's someone modifying a file on disk, modifying network packets, each element, each of these is tampering with something you're not supposed to tamper with. The R in stride stands for repudiation. And whether that's Han Solo saying there's been a reactor meltdown and it's very dangerous, saying, I didn't get your email, I'm so sorry, could you re must have hit a spam filter, I didn't order that. Um, each of these is an example of denying responsibility, repudiating that you were, had taken some action, whether it's true or not, each of these is an example of a repudiation, which is the R in stride. Now, the I in stride stands for information disclosure. And if you're paying attention, you may notice that I don't have a Lego display for this scene. And that is because despite the misguided opinions of some movie critics who believe that Star Wars is about a hero's journey or the relationship of Luke to his father. Really, Star Wars, from the opening scene where we see Princess Leia's ship being perceived by a Star Destroyer, all the way through the climactic fi final battle, Star Wars is the story of information disclosure and its consequences. I urge you to rewatch the movie in this light. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. But information disclosure isn't just about Death Star plans. It can also be other forms of information. It can be the contents of your financials for the next quarter. It can be the names of files. It can be the names of people working for you, you know, and, in the news recently, there have been many instances of inappropriate information disclosure um, in, a, in a wide variety of ways. So the I in stride stands for information disclosure. The D in stride stands for denial of service. And whether that's freezing Han Solo and carbonite, filling a hard drive with so much information that you can't write anymore, or filling a network pipe, each of these is an example of preventing a computer system from being available. And so the D in stride, denial of service. And lastly, the E in stride stands for elevation of privilege. Now that might be Ben Kenobi saying these aren't the droids you're looking for. It might be someone discovering a what you hoped was a hidden wet web interface for administration. There might be some other way in which people are exceeding the authorized use of a system. Each of these is an elevation to a privilege level that someone isn't supposed to have. 
So stride is a great way to help focus your answer to the second question of what can go wrong. With that, I'm going to speak briefly about what are you going to do about it. And the question of did you do an acceptable job, number one through three, well, really, I don't have great Star Wars content to help you with that one. But you can bring the same sort of project management approach that you bring to other projects to a threat modeling project to check your work. The question of what are you going to do about it is the, what I'd like you to take from this slide is that each of the stride threats is the opposite of a property that you want your system to have. The opposite of spoofing is authentication. The opposite of tampering is integrity. And each of these has a set of known and understood approaches to help you implement it. So for example, passwords and multi-factor authentication are forms of authentication. Digital signatures can aid in authentication. If you're concerned about the integrity of files, you can ensure that the permissions or ACLs are set correctly. You can use digital signatures to authenticate that a file has moved from one system to another, et cetera, et cetera. Each of the each of the threats has standard defensive techniques that you can bring to bear in the systems that you're building and deploying. So, so with that, I'd like to shift gears a little bit because I've been privileged to help a lot of people develop a threat modeling approach for their organization. I've been privileged to talk to lots of people who have given me over the years frank feedback about what works for them and what doesn't, and that's great. And in talking to all of these different organizations, I've found that there is a tendency for people to fall into traps. And for each of these traps that we're going to discuss today, I want to discuss with you not only what the trap is, but why people fall into it, how you can see that you've fallen into it, and how to get out of it. So with that, let's move to the first trap. So the first trap is saying, search your feelings. And if you think about it, every time someone says, search your feelings, is when they're about to make a dramatic mistake. And while this is great for keeping the action and drama of the movie going forward, the last thing your project probably needs is action or drama in that sort of way. So, oftentimes, people in security will say something like, think like an attacker, which is just as useless to most people as saying, search your feelings. People need a degree of structure. That's what Stride is there for. It's to structure, help you structure your thinking, not straightjacket your thinking, but structure your thinking so that you can systematically and repeatedly go through a system and find the same sorts of problems. And if I just tell you, think like an attacker, do you know how to do that? Probably not. So it doesn't give you what you need. And what's worse, it may make people in the room feel bad or stupid and I learned this lesson when someone came up to me after I had said, think like an attacker to them in a meeting. And they sort of shut down for the meeting. And then afterwards, they came up to me and politely and gently told me that it wasn't the most productive thing to say. No, no actually, that wasn't what happened. They told me that I'm not going to repeat what they said, but it wasn't the most pleasant thing to hear. 
But the truth was, for them, it wasn't pleasant to hear think like an attacker. It made them feel dumb. It made them less productive. And since that day, I've tried to avoid saying think like an attacker when I'm not sure everyone in the room is a security expert who understands that I'm exhorting them to try to be a little more tricky, et cetera. And so don't say search your feelings. Don't say think like an attacker, but say let's go through this in a structured way and find some real problems. Now, trap number two is to say you're never done with threat modeling. Now, look, I'm a guy who wrote a long book on threat modeling, and I'm very sympathetic to this claim that you're never done threat modeling. But let's say that I was at an organization where threat modeling wasn't part of the daily practices, and I wanted to make it part of those. So I go to the VP in charge of all of this and say, hey, I've got a great idea. Let's threat model. And be optimistic for a moment. She'll say, great, how long will that take? We'll do it. And I say, well, you're never done threat modeling. How does that fit into a product plan? How does that fit into a project plan? The answer is it doesn't, and so neither does threat modeling. And so even though, as an expert, as an enthusiast, I like to think I'm never quite done and there's always something more to find, there's also something else that needs to be done. And so today, I like to unroll this loop a little bit. I like to optimize this and treat it as four steps. And you'll notice that these four steps are these four questions. There's model, what are you building? Identify threats, what can go wrong? Mitigate, what are you going to do about it? And validate, do you do a good job at one through three? Same approach that we've been using, just more linear. So trap number three, is to say the way the threat model is without knowing what you're threat modeling. Now, if I were to come to you as a programmer and say, hey, I'm building a program, what programming language should I use? Maybe you have your favorite and you'd just say you should use this or that, whatever it might be. But maybe you'd ask me a question. You'd say, what's the application you're building? And maybe it's a phone app, and so the answer is Objective-C or, or Java. Maybe I'm building an insecure web application, in which case the, the answer is PHP. The different languages have their strengths and weaknesses, and similarly different threat modeling approaches have their strengths and weaknesses. It's important to focus on what's going to help people find good threats. And it's important to focus on what's going to help the team that's actually doing the threat modeling find good threats. You might have a different answer if what you're developed if you have a different skill set. And so the trap is to jump to an answer such as stride with DFDs rather than understand the fullness of what's getting built. Now, a variant of this is to think of threat modeling as a monolithic process. You might believe that those Legos I showed you earlier were just for fun, and they are, but they're also an important part of how I think about threat modeling, which is I think about it as a set of building blocks that can, in, that can walk together and make interesting things. Not everything you might want to threat, use in threat modeling will snap together with everything else, but modeling approaches such as data flow diagrams, swim lanes, can be used in conjunction with ways to identify threats such as stride, such as KPEC, um, which is a MITRE project, the Common Attack Pattern Enumeration and Categorization, I'll talk more about in just a second. 
You might use attack trees. You might use kill chains. Each of these is a model of how to think about what's going to go wrong. Now, similarly, there are, there are building blocks you can use for thinking about privacy as well as thinking about security. So, for example, contextual integrity is an approach to thinking about what's the right, what are the expectations and norms in a context, in a scenario, and how might those be violated? The same behavior might be appropriate in one place and not appropriate in another. If I go to my doctor and say, Doc, I have a rash, and my doctor calls another doctor and says, my patient presented with these symptoms, what do you think? That would be fine if she's doing it in her office. If I run into my doctor in the supermarket and she said, hey, Adam called me and had this rash, that would be weird because it breaks the rules of the context. It's talking about these things out of the place where they should be talked about. Similarly, um, another tool for looking at privacy is uh, Dan Solov has a book called Understanding Privacy. And in there, he comes up with a taxonomy of privacy harms which you can use to predict the way in which a system which you haven't written any code for might violate people's privacy expectations or goals. So the different building blocks make sense for different people. And so Stride is a great tool if you're a security expert. It's a high-level way to think about the, what's going to go wrong. And attack trees help you graph out and show graphically what's going to go wrong. But KPEC, and KPEC is a pattern language, and so it has a pattern for SQL injection. And it will tell you within the KPEC documentation that SQL injection is a problem that happens when you have a database and it's exposed to untrusted input. And so the way in which you defend against it is to use, for example, prepared statements. The way you test for it is to, for example, includes putting quote characters in, putting SQL statements into each form, et cetera. And so if you're an expert in something else, if you're an expert in databases or networking, a pattern listing like the KPEC can be a very valuable way to help you learn about these security problems which you might have without having to become a security expert. Similarly, the kill chain model from Lockheed Martin talks about how attackers get in, how they move around, how they extract data. Super helpful, but if you don't have an understanding of how attacks work, it may be a little abstract or a little too detailed for you to work with. Now, there's one other thing which people often ask me for, and that is, can you please give me a checklist of everything that's going to go wrong in this application I'm building? And it's a reasonable question. You know, I, I would love to have a list of things that can go wrong so that we can help people prevent them. Usually, the question I respond with is, are you doing anything new and innovative in this thing you're building? And the answer is always yes, while we're doing this and we're doing this. It's great. If you're doing something new and different, you might have problems which are new and different. And so I can't give you a checklist. Sorry. What I can tell you is that I used to hate checklists. The checklist approach to security is nonsense. People have to think about these things. And then I read this wonderful little book called The Checklist Manifesto by Atul Gawand. And in the checklist manifesto, in reading the checklist manifesto, what I learned is there are certain circumstances where checklists are super helpful at saving lives. 
And that is when you have five to seven things that often go wrong and that can be answered with a yes-no sort of thing. So, for example, the checklist for landing an airplane might be are the flaps up, is the landing gear down, etc. You might have a few of those quick questions. Now, you don't want to hand me that checklist and tell me to land your plane. It will be problematic. But if I knew how to fly a plane, the checklist can help me avoid mistakes with things that are hard to see. So I need to look at instruments to tell me, yes, the landing gear is down, etc. So checklists can similarly be used. And in the, the threat modeling book, there's lots of checklists that are designed to help you threat model more effectively and avoid common mistakes. Um, then lastly, there are checklists like PCI, uh, the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard, which can help you avoid some set of operational mistakes, but being PCI compliant might not be all the security which you need. So trap number four is to think of threat modeling as a single skill. There are a set of techniques, drawing good data flow diagrams that have the right things in them, using stride to find threats, building or using an attack tree. And each of these is a technique that you can think about learning, developing skill in. There's also repertoire, knowing about things like SSL spoof and fire sheep as spoofing tools, reading books by folks like Kevin Mitnick or The Cuckoo's Egg by uh, Cliff Stoll gives you stories that can help you do a better job at threat modeling. And one of the things that you can use these stories for is you might encounter the objection, but no one would ever do that. And when someone said, but no one would ever do that, I used to say, ha-ha, let me tell you a story. And it turned out that sometimes that worked and sometimes it didn't work. What I discovered is that when people say, but no one would ever do that, there's two things that they might mean. The first thing they mean is, but no one would ever do that, in which case telling them a story um, may actually get them get them over that hump. The second thing they might mean is, but I don't want to fix this. And if what they mean is I don't want to fix this, telling them a story isn't going to do them any good. So now when someone says that, what I'll ask is, if I can give you an example of a time that someone did that, will you agree to fix this problem? And then we can have a conversation about what meaning they have, and we can have a more productive conversation. So there's technique and there's repertoire. You bring them to bear differently. Trap number five is believing that threat modeling is born, not taught. So to continue a little bit with the technique and repertoire of thinking, when someone learns to play a violin, they need to develop and maintain muscles. They need easy tunes that they can learn how to play. And, you know, not everyone wants to be a virtuoso and play Carnegie Hall. Some people may just want to be weekend musicians and play with their friends in a garage band, and that's fine. It's important and to think about this in a way, and I like to borrow a line here from Lando Calrissian and say, we've got to give them more time. So trap number six is the wrong focus. And I'm going to take these wrong focuses one at a time because they can be a little controversial. And so the first, the first wrong place to focus is on your assets. And this can seem a little heretical. After all, if there are no assets, if there's nothing of value, 
why are we threat modeling? Good question. The trouble is starting from your assets. So what do you do? First, you have an argument about what's an asset. Is it every computer in the network? Is it the money in the bank? Is it the company's reputation? And so you end up with this very apples and oranges sort of list. And then you say, okay, it's just the money in the bank. And I've spent some time helping banks that model. And it turns out that there's a system, it's a mainframe usually, called the general ledger, and that's where the money is. That's where your account balance is stored. That's where it comes in and goes out. And then there's a system of computers around that, which are application servers of various sorts, which have the ability to change money in the general ledger. So the money isn't just in the general ledger, but these other systems are very important. And then there's a set of systems around those. And then there are the sysadmins who are allowed to log into those things who are on the same network as other people. And all of a sudden, as you start to draw one more layer and one more layer, you end up with a map of your whole network, not a map of your asset. And so what do you do when you have that? What are you building or deploying? Well, then you go into what can go wrong. What good did it do to start from the general ledger? That's an interesting question to which I've yet to hear a really good answer. So I'm not opposed to including assets or thinking about assets, but you don't necessarily need to start there. Now, you might also want to focus on your attackers. After all, if no one's going to attack your system, then why are we doing this? It's a good question. Now, when I, when I fly around, which, which I do more than I really want to, I, I like to read spy novels, you know, John le Carre, that sort of thing. And I had, I had the lovely experience of sharing an office once with a guy who used to work counterintelligence for the FBI. And so I got to ask him, how do Russian spies really work? And it turns out that my mental model from reading all of these spy novels wasn't accurate. I was wrong. But if I was thinking about them and what they do, then I have an opportunity first to misunderstand how they're going to behave. And second, I have an opportunity to misunderstand who's going to attack me. And so I'm going to come up with my list of attackers. I'm going to come up with my list of behaviors. And then I'm going to think about what, are, what am I building and defending. But before I've gotten there, I've got two opportunities for own goals. Now, again, it might be useful to say, can I give you an example, and will you agree to fix this problem if I can, and bring attackers in later to humanize the possible issues that you found by thinking about what you're building what can go wrong, and then what are you going to do about it? But you don't need to start there. The next wrong focus is thinking that threat modeling should focus on finding threats. Seems natural, it's threat modeling. Finding threats is just a step on the way to fixing them. If you just come up with a list of threats and you don't do anything about it, I would love a copy of that list. I can sell it to attorneys for a lot of money. It would be great. Please, please just send it my way. I'll, I'll put you in for a cut. Now, remember trap number three, the way the threat model is. There are, there are people out there who start from attackers, who start from assets, and it works wonderfully. And if it's working for them, if it's working for you, if it's working for your organization, please don't change because I'm telling you it's the wrong focus. But if you're just getting started, or if the approach you have isn't working, consider if your focus is correct and if you're starting in the right place. So trap seven, trap seven is thinking that threat modeling is for specialists. And I'm a little bit aspirational here. I look forward to the day when threat modeling is like a version control. 
every sysadmin, every developer I've worked with, excuse me, and most every sysadmin understand how to use version control of various types. If I were to interview a candidate and say, you know, tell me about branch management, and I'll, I'll be nice. I'll say, tell me about branch management and something that's not Git. They might say, you know, they might have a good answer for that. But if they said, you know, I've heard about this version control thing, but it's not for me, I would say, that's great. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. There are people, there are people at large organizations that manage the build process for these large complex problems, products, excuse me, these large complex products. And I look forward to the day when I can ask a candidate, tell me about threat modeling. Tell me how you'd find a problem in this. And their answer might not be up to my answer, but they wouldn't say, I've heard about that threat modeling thing, but it doesn't work for me. We, I look forward to having a range of skills where everyone knows a little bit about how to threat model. Trap number eight is threat modeling in a vacuum. There are some things that are easy to fix if you have access to the source code. For example, you can add logging about what the business logic is doing and why. There are some things that are easy, and easy is in quotes, please note, for operations to fix, which is look at the logs. And of course, this is a little bit dependent on the idea that there's this big split between development and operations and DevOps doesn't exist. But run with the example for with me. And understand that good threat modeling can build connections between the different disciplines, the different groups, the different um, organizations. You can, build, you can say, here's a security operations guide before a product is built and say, hey, can you do these things and make sure you understand it? And that security operations guide, implicit as it is being built, there is a model of what the operations people will be doing. And you bring it to the operations people, and after they stop laughing at you and you revise it a little bit, it works as a way to communicate what the expectations are because there are things that the developers can fix, there are things the operations folks can fix, and there are things that the other group has no influence over. If I'm shipping you a piece of software as a download over the Internet, I can't control if you run it behind a firewall or not. I might think it's important that you do so. I might think it's important that you take other actions. And if you threat model in a vacuum and assume that everything needs to be fixed in one place, you're going to run into trouble. Similarly, a set of non-requirements can help you address this, and I'll talk more about that in just a second. So trap number nine is a laser-like focus on threats. There is an interplay between them, and the first interplay is that requirements can help you understand what the threats are. If someone were to say, the plans for this battle station must not fall into rebel hands, then you know you have an important confidentiality requirement or an important information disclosure threat. Now, it might go the other way. There might be some open source advocates who say, with enough eyes, all trenches are shallow, I and mean, excuse me, all bugs are shallow. And thus, we should publish the plans for this battle station. It will make things scarier for those rebels. He's right. The answer doesn't matter. What's important is that either statement drives a conversation about the interplay of the requirement and the threat so that you can come to agreement on what the appropriate approach is. Now, similarly, there's an interplay between threats and mitigations. So, for example, you might, I might say that 
Um, there's a threat someone's going to come in through my back door. And so the mitigation is I'll put a better lock on it and then I'm done, right? Obviously not. There's I might put a good lock on it, someone might kick in the door, someone might come through the window, someone might find the little key in the little rock thing that's outside. There's lots of ways in which mitigations get bypassed. And so as you build features, it's important to think, how might someone bypass this mitigation and go deep and make sure that you're thinking through each of those bypasses to the extent that there's time available to do so or testing resources available to do so. Now lines five and six are a little funny because I'm when I drew this triangle model, I really only had line five, which is unmitigatable threats drive requirements. If you're going to say that in order to administer this system, we're going to need a sysadmin who has access to all of the files, that's a decision you can make. But if you're not going to defend against admin, you shouldn't spend any time defending against admin. You should write down that this is a non-requirement so that you can focus your defenses in places you're going, you believe you can succeed. That can be a challenging conversation, but it's a worthwhile one to have. And then I was stuck thinking about line number six until I realized that in a sense, a requirement to deploy a mitigation without a discussion of the threat that you're protecting against, well, that sounds a little bit like some compliance requirements I've encountered. And so maybe part of the reason we're not so fond of compliance requirements is because the direct requirement to deploy a mitigation can be a little frustrating. Oops, never mind that. Um, one other thing I do want to say here is it's become popular in the couple of years since Ed Snowden got sysadmin against whom the defenses weren't quite up to snuff, since Ed Snowden started publishing his revelations, it's become popular to say the threat, the threat model has changed or the threats have changed. And I want to call bunk on that. If your threat model didn't tell you that someone might monitor your unencrypted network connection, it was a bad threat model. If your threat model didn't tell you that someone might put a piece of malware on your computer and read your files, it was a bad threat model. What's changed is the requirements that customers are willing to pay for. And this may sound a little bit like nitpicking. The reason it's important is because if the requirements have changed, then the overall threats you need to defend against have changed. And it's important to think about this because when someone next tells you, well, the threat model has changed, you want to think about what that means and make sure you're responding to it in the appropriate fashion. Finally, trap number 10, threat modeling at the wrong time. You don't want to be like this guy on the bridge of the Death Star and have some flunky come up and say, sir, we've analyzed their attack pattern and there is a danger. Maybe if you had analyzed the threats beforehand, you could have fixed this while your Death Star was still in space dock. You could put some big steel plates down these trenches. You could put more guns in the trenches. I'm not sure what the right fix is, but I'm sure that threat modeling while the rebel fighters are in the trenches, not the right time. So it's a mistake you don't want to make. I have a few bonus traps I want to share with you around some technologies and tricky areas. The first is when you're threat modeling web technologies. There's a trap of focusing in on cross-site scripting or SQL injection. The reason this is a trap is because 
You don't need threat modeling to tell you that your applications may be vulnerable to these sorts of problems. What you really want your web threat modeling to focus on is the unique problems of your new unique website, what your dependencies are, what your trust boundaries are, how things are going to fail that are unique to, to the thing which you are building or deploying. There's a trap in thinking that cloud is so complicated we can't possibly think about it. But the truth is most cloud-based systems are similar to other computer systems which you're familiar with, and there's a few new things that are different. The first is you're moving the trust boundaries or you're letting outsiders into them. So that might include the operations team at your cloud provider is a source of threat. You should think about that. You shouldn't obsess about it, but you should think about it. More, probably much more interesting is that other customers of that cloud provider might be in a better position to attack you while you're deploying at that cloud provider than they are when you're deploying inside your own data centers. Secondly, while I'm not a lawyer, there are a set of legal threats that change in the U.S. legal system as I understand it. One set to think about is around forensics and chain of custody, where the cloud provider may or may not be willing to capture data that you can use in a course. Um, and you should understand what that might mean if you ever want to take someone to court. And secondly, there's a set of threats where having provided data to what's called a third party, your ability to argue that that data is private and should be protected from a court order may be less than it would be if it were in your own data center. And so you should understand what that means with respect to a variety of governments around the world. Another trap is around human factors. And there's, there's something that security professionals often say which is given a choice between security and dancing babies, people will choose the dancing baby every time. And you know, I don't think people buy their computer to be secure. They buy their computer to keep up with their friends on Facebook, to watch funny cat videos, to do these different things. And we need to do a better job of respecting people's goals and understanding understanding the ways in which they're going to behave. And there are models of people that you can use. There are models like the behaviorist model. Um, and one thing that we learn from the behaviorist is that people get conditioned, animals get conditioned. And so if, for example, every time you want to open a document, a dialog box pops up that says some files may harm your computer, you're going to get very adept at clicking the dismiss button there. And you may notice, for example, in more recent versions of Microsoft Office, it opens up in a, it opens the document for you in a sandboxed mode, and there's a little gold bar across the top allowing you to do more. And that's to give people, that's to reduce the that is to reduce the conditioning effect. Similarly, there are models of cognitive science where we know that people anchor to things, we know that people respond to the indicators they see, and that things that are not present are hard, it's hard for people to recall them. And so you can bring models of people into your analysis of software systems and do a better job of predicting how they'll behave and do a better job of building systems that are secure even as they're being used by real people. And it's a worthwhile thing to do. So to summarize, anyone can threat model and everyone should. The techniques, the skills, the repertoire can all be learned and there are lots of traps that can make it harder to be successful. 
But I believe that threat modeling can be the most effective way to drive security through your product, through your service, or through your system. And so I encourage you to do so. So a call to action. Remember the four questions. What are you deploying or building? What can go wrong? What are you going to do about it? Did you do a good job? I want to encourage you to be proactive, to drive threat modeling through your organization. When you're getting started, reward the practice. Learn what works for your organization. And once you've learned that, start to require it. Start to make sure that it's being done on every project, on every system, because it's a worthwhile thing that will drive more security throughout your organization for yourself or your customers. To close out, I want to quote George Box, a fellow of the Royal Society. He said that all models are wrong and some models are useful. I encourage you to focus in on the useful kind. So with that, if you have these sort of questions, which can fit in 140 characters, I'm happy to take questions via Twitter. I did happen to write a book, which also has some answers in it. And there's information about that at threatmodelingbook.com or wherever fine books are sold. And so with that, just one more thing. I want to share some resources with you, and then we'll wrap. A few more resources are some of the books that I mentioned. Uh, I may not have mentioned Thinking Fast and Slow, a wonderful book by Daniel Kahneman, which is my go-to for thinking about people and threat models. Um, as an author, I just wish I could write as clearly about a big, complex subject as the human brain as Daniel Kahneman does, but I suppose that's why he has a Nobel Prize and I don't. Um, so with that, I'm going to just say thank you very much for your time, and go forth, threat model, make things more secure. Thank you. <laughs>